Good day, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, webinar in the webinar episode that is brought to you by the ITU AI and Machine Learning Faculty Challenge. My name is Thomas Plaskoro, and it is my privilege to introduce today's webinar. The ITU AI and Machine Learning 5G Challenge is organized by the ITU, which is United Nations Agency for ICTs. The mandate of the ITU is to allocate frequencies to services that uses the radio spectrum, to develop standards, and to assist developing countries in setting up their ICT infrastructure. This challenge is currently sponsored by Zyrins, and we are grateful for their sponsorship. The challenge aims to create a community that will solve network-related problems using AI and machine learning. And now it's time for me to introduce the speaker of today's uh, webinar. Today's talk is going to be given by Jose Suarez Ferreira. Jose holds a PhD in computer science from Polytechnic University of Catalonia, UPC in Spain, which he obtained in 2020. Previously, he received his BSc and the MSc degree in telecommunication engineering from Granada University. This was in 2014 and 2017. He is currently working as a postdoctoral researcher at the Barcelona Neural Network Center, BNN UPC, and is the co-principal investigator of the EU-funded project Ignition. In this project, his team is developing a framework for fast prototyping of graph neural networks applied to networks networking. During 2019, he was a visiting researcher at University of Siena in Italy under the supervision of Professor Franco Scasseri. His main research interests are in the fields of artificial intelligence applied to networking and traffic monitoring and analysis. In today's talk, uh, he will present the Graph Neural Networking Challenge 2021. This is the total uh, this year's edition of the Graph Neural Network Challenge. This is the second edition of this uh, competition, and it brings a fundamental limitation of existing graph neural networks. This is related to their lack of generalization, as well as capability to large graphs. Thus, in order to achieve production-ready graph neural networks, uh, genome-based solutions, we need models that can be trained in networks, uh, in network tests based of limited size, and then they can be they can operate with guarantees in any type of uh, real customer network. Now, in this session, he's going to introduce uh, the challenge and explain all the details of the challenge. So let me not uh, go through all the details because they're going to, present, to be presented by Jose. So at this time, I'd like to welcome Jose. Uh, hi, Jose, good afternoon. Good afternoon, hello all. Uh, thank you very much for the very good introduction. So I, I will present today, I will be very happy to present uh, the, the edition, this new edition of the Graph Your Networking Challenge. Okay, so well, as uh, Thomas has already uh, said, I'm uh, Jose Suarez Varela from the Barcelona Neural Networking Center. And today I will introduce the Graph Neural Networking Challenge, uh, the, particularly the edition of, of this year. So first of all, I would like to briefly introduce the graph neural networks, uh, which is the, the main topic of uh, around this uh, challenge. Uh, graph neural networks, in short, is uh, a neural network family quite recent <clears throat> that is tailored uh, to learn from graph structure data. And particularly, uh, it has been extensively used in uh, many different fields where the data is uh, naturally represented uh, in the form of graphs. So as an example, we have uh, chemistry where we have uh, molecules or physics where we can have uh, gravitational systems, uh, biology, recommender systems. So in general, uh, we have many uh, successful applications of uh, GNN to, to different fields. And at the top of this, uh, sorry, at the bottom of this slide, you can find a reference if you are interested in finding uh, relevant applications on, on GNN. Well, uh, before going to, to the specific uh, topic of the challenge, uh, I would like to highlight that uh, GNNs are probably the next big thing in the, in the field of uh, AI and machine learning. 
Indeed, uh, we are witnessing uh, an increasing number of publications in top uh, class uh, conferences of the machine learning field, like uh, NeurIPS or ICLR. So just as a reference, you have a figure at the right where you can see the evolution of papers published uh, along years. And we can observe a clear exponential growth of, of papers in the last uh, few years. Uh, and also, if we go to, to specific fields where machine learning has been uh, or has, has, has very successful applications, like the natural language processing, I think it's uh, quite classical, the application of machine learning in this field, we can see that uh, the new trend are uh, nowadays transformers. And particularly transformers are a special type of uh, graph neural networks. So even in classic uh, fields, uh, we are watching uh, interesting applications of uh, DNN. And particularly uh, in the networking field, we are also witnessing a growing number of uh, applications of graph neural networks. So if you're interested particularly on DNN applications the, to, to data networks, uh, please, uh, you can find uh, more information in the third reference that uh, compiles some references on, on DNNs for, for different networking use cases. So uh, particularly focusing on the, on the networking field, how can we apply uh, graph neural networks? Well, First of all, I would like to introduce you the, the concept of digital twin. Uh, maybe most of you are already know this concept because, because it, is, uh, it is becoming quite popular nowadays and it is being applied to, to many different fields. But uh, just as a brief um, summary, uh, I would say that a, a digital twin is a virtual replica of a physical object or process. And particularly, this enables to simulate the behavior of a physical object under any uh, input conditions. So in this image, you have an example of, of what would be a digital twin of uh, a plane. And this uh, model would enable to answer questions like, uh, what will happen if uh, there is a specific failure in this uh, plane? Uh, for instance, in the electrical system, or what happened if I make uh, an important change in the, in the plane, like uh, testing a new wing design. So particularly in the networking field, uh, a digital twin is basically the box you can see here. And this box is intended to emulate the behavior of a real uh, network infrastructure. And uh, considering all the intricacies of uh, real uh, network devices um, and uh, operational or networks in production. So the input of this box is basically a description with input conditions. So in this case would be uh, some features of the network state, like uh, the network topology, uh, the traffic or different configuration components. Then this network digital twin would emulate the, the system under these uh, input conditions. And finally, it would produce uh, fine-grained performance metrics at uh, many different levels. So for instance, we can have uh, statistics at the level of flows, like um, the end-to-end -end delay or jitter or loss. Then we can have uh, statistics at the level of links or devices, uh, ports. Well, we, we can have many performance stats uh, at different levels of the network. And this network digital twin is a fundamental piece that can be applied to a plethora of uh, networking use cases. So particularly uh, compared to traditional alternatives, it can be very useful for applications uh, that are aware of fine-grained quality of service metrics. And just to give you some examples of uh, a, very, a huge list of uh, applications that it can have, for example, in the area of network planning and upgrading, uh, it would enable to answer questions like, uh, if I'm an operator, what is the best link upgrade given a limited budget? or how much can customer traffic increase uh, until we need a network upgrade? 
or what is the optimal link redundancy that we need in the network, uh, considering a maximum number of uh, link failures. Then in the area of troubleshooting or performance analysis, uh, we can imagine a use case. Uh, again, we are uh, an operator. And imagine that we have a temporary service disruption that affects uh, some customer service level agreements. So for the next time, we can try to find a more robust configuration that can prevent this problem in the future by testing uh, different routing configurations or possible link upgrades or so on. And finally, in the area of network optimization, just uh, as an example, uh, we can perform also what if analysis and answer questions like, uh, what is the optimal configurations that warranties my customer SLAs while having minimum impact on the, on the rest of the traffic or the best effort traffic? Or uh, in the field of traffic engineering, how should I reroute uh, properly my traffic in case I have uh, a failure or a performance degradation? Well, so, I would like to make a brief comparison uh, of um, with traditional alternatives used for network modeling or just to build uh, network digital twins. So traditionally, uh, there exist two main alternatives. The first one is based usually on network simulation, which uh, can achieve uh, accurate results but it is indeed uh, computationally very expensive. And if we apply it to large scale real world network, just imagine that they need to simulate each packet uh, traversing the network. So, so in practice, they are very costly and they are limited to, to middle and small scale uh, scenarios. And also uh, a second uh, type of solution would be based on analytical models like uh, keying theory or fluid models, uh, network calculus. But the problem of these uh, techniques is that when they are applied to the real world network, they remain uh, quite inaccurate because they are not able to model um, the, the particularities of real infrastructures like real traffic patterns or uh, simply the multi-hop routing scheme. So, just I would like to highlight the advantages that can have a DNN with respect to these state-of-the-art uh, solutions. First of all, as it is based on machine learning, it, uh, it enables to or it achieves a fast computation or fast execution. And moreover, uh, it can be easily parallelized by using uh, GPUs. So compared to land network simulation, it, it is much uh, lightweight. Second, this is a data-driven uh, technique, so as uh, other machine learning techniques. So it can be trained with uh, data from real networks, and potentially it can lead to higher accuracy than, for example, network simulation. And finally, it offers very good uh, deployability properties compared to other machine learning-based techniques. And this is mainly because uh, graph neural networks are the only technique that demonstrate the capability to generalize to different networks to those seen during the training phase. So this enables uh, to train the model in a controlled test bed, for example, at the vendor's lab, and then be able to deploy it directly in the real world network without any additional retraining. So uh, let me explain this, um, particularly this concept uh, later in more detail. Now I, I would like to introduce uh, more specifically the challenge <laughs> for this edition. So the graph neural networking challenge uh, of this year is entitled uh, Creating a Scalable Network Digital Twin. Uh, you have you have here the the link to the to the website for more details, but I will introduce the the fundamentals of this uh, challenge. So coming back to the deployability issue, this is how uh, we um, approach uh, that we can design a commercial machine learning based solution to build uh, digital twins. So if we are a vendor, we can have a control uh, network testbed 
and we can generate samples uh, on this test bed just uh, as a training uh, data set uh, for a machine learning model that can be in this case a neural network. So after that, we should have a digital twin uh, product. And this product could be directly deployed in the real world customer network. And the other alternative would be to uh, directly train this digital twin in the customer network. But uh, the problem is that it can lead to service disruption as uh, the digital twin uh, needs samples that cover uh, a wide variety of uh, cases. Like, for example, simulating link failures, which is not feasible in, in the real world network. So as a conclusion or as a consequence, we need uh, machine learning models that can generalize to other network that were not seen during the training phase. And at this moment, the only machine learning technique that demonstrated this uh, capability are uh, graph neural networks. So considering this uh, commercialization workflow, we have uh, a network testbed of limited size uh, where we can train our solution. And we can have the, uh, a neural network model or particularly a DNN. So we can produce a digital twin and then deploy it directly in the real world network, which is much larger in size. So the problem here is that we can find real world networks that um, as a rule of thumb can be more than 10 times larger than the vendor's training testbed, as, as the vendor cannot replicate uh, networks that have a comparable size to to those of real world networks. So one solution would be to create a network digital twin that can scale to, to considerably larger networks. So basically this is the challenge uh, that we pose in, in this edition. And indeed, if we look at the machine learning literature, we can see that building scalable graph neural network models is nowadays an open problem that is being uh, is investigated. And we could find only some few recent proposals, but they are uh, specifically tailored to some problems like uh, graph classification. So here you have some examples of the papers that we could find, but this is uh, still considered an unsolved uh, problem. So. So this is also an open challenge uh, for the machine learning community. So the objective of this uh, challenge is basically to build the box that you can see here in the slide. So this uh, box would be mainly based on neural networks. And it would have as input a description of uh, a network snapshot. Uh, particularly, it has uh, three components, which are the topology, the traffic matrix, um, the routing configuration, and it should be able to produce per path uh, mean delay estimates uh, for each uh, scenario. So for this, we generated uh, data sets with a packet accurate network simulator uh, called Omnet++. And our data sets have the, the structure that you can see in the image. And first of all, we generate a network state snapshot that is described by a network topology, a source destination routing scheme, and also an end-to-end -end traffic matrix. And then this simulator generates several network performance metrics at different levels, uh, including particularly statistics at the level of flows or ports. So at the level of flows, we provide the statistics like delay, jitter, or loss. And at the level of ports, we provide the statistics like the key utilization or some other interesting uh, parameters. So in total, we generated thousands of simulation samples that cover a wide variety of uh, operational scenarios including uh, 
uh, many congestion levels and different topologies and routing configurations. So the objective of this challenge is basically to test the scalability properties of the solutions proposed by participants. So to this end, we first generated a data set for training that includes samples in networks of small scale, comparable to those that we can find uh, at the vendor's lab, uh, from 25 to 50 nodes. Um, and then the idea is to scale to, to, to networks that are much larger in size. So particularly our validation and test data sets include samples from 51 to 300 nodes. So just uh, uh, to remind this, the idea is that uh, the solutions should be trained on a small scale networks and then they will be validated in large scale networks. For the evaluation, we will use uh, this metric uh, you can see here called uh, mean absolute percentage error. And this is basically uh, related to the, to the relative error on, on the model's predictions. So by the end of the challenge on September 15th, we will release a test data set that will be unlabeled. So it won't contain any uh, output labels or performance and values generated by the, by the simulator. So participants have to label this data set and they will be able to submit it in our automatic evaluation platform so they will be able to see their score in real time and compare it with uh, other teams. So the evaluation phase will last uh, only 15 days uh, and it will be made just after the test data set is released. Okay, so as a starting point, we provide a baseline model that can be a good reference to, to start with a challenge. This model is called a roundnet, and basically this box has the same inputs and outputs that we need um, uh, for the solution of this challenge for the network digital twin. Indeed, if you check the reference, you can see that roundnet was able to generalize to different network state snapshots, including different topologies and routing configurations and traffic. But Particularly when Roundnet is applied to, to this challenge, the problem is that it doesn't have a very good scalability properties. So it is not very good when uh, making estimates on networks that are considerably larger to those seen during the training phase. Um, particularly what we observed in our experiments is that when we apply Roundnet to, to the data sets of this challenge, it achieves a relative error around 300%, which is uh, considerably very, very large, uh, quite large. So just you can use Roundnet as a reference and upgrade it to make it uh, more scalable. This would be a good approach to face the challenge. Um, for this, we provide um, two open source implementations uh, of Roundnet. Uh, one is in TensorFlow, which is a well-known framework. On, on generic framework on machine learning. And then uh, another one in Ignition, which is a framework for fast prototyping of uh, graph neural networks. And this provides a higher level abstraction uh, to specifically to design uh, GNNs. So I would like to, to give some guidelines for those that uh, want to participate in this challenge. I see two main directions to participate. One would be to take uh, the baseline model, Roundnet, uh, as, a, as a starting point and try to upgrade it. And the other one would be to design your own neural network architectures uh, from scratch. So I would focus or in the first uh, one. I, I will explain or I will give some tips on how to proceed with uh, Roundnet. So first of all, we provide a tutorial on the repository of Roundnet on how to modify and understand the, the code. So I think it can be very useful to, to 
to upgrade the, the model. And then also, if I would like to give some insights on, on the data sets that we provide for this challenge. So basically, we need to scale to, to large networks. So if we take a close look to, to our data sets, we can see that there are two main features that differ in large networks with respect to the small networks in the training data set. First of all, as networks are larger, uh, we, can, we also find that paths are uh, longer on average uh, as the network has a uh, higher diameter. And the second one is that we can find considerably larger link capacities as in the central links of large scale networks in need uh, higher capacities to carry all the traffic the, that they that traverses the network. So as a first approach, we need a model that can effectively scale to these two features, um, longer paths and higher link capacities. Then we have another important obstacle. So if we look, uh, we take a quick look to the distribution of delays, just remind that this is the, the output of the of the solutions for this challenge. So here you have a representation of delays in the log scale. The blue values are those of the training data set and the orange values represent the values that you can expect in the test uh, data set. So you can see that there is a clear shift in the distributions. And this um, implies a relevant problem that is unsolved in the machine learning field and uh, as it uh, requires to produce values that are out of the distribution. So it means that if we train the model with the values in the blue of, of the blue distribution, it, it is quite challenging to then be able to produce uh, the other values of the test uh, data set. So one, one approach that we think that can be useful is to transform the output of uh, the, digi the digital twin or the neural network in order to follow similar distributions in the training and the test data set. So we think that uh, one good approach would be to use uh, Q utilization, but let me uh, check on the on the picture. So if we come back to to the data sets, we have here in the image uh, all the features that include the each sample. So we have the input features that describe the network state, and I will focus particularly on the output labels generated by this simulator, that includes a wide variety of uh, performance metrics at the level of flows and ports. So the main idea here is that we can train our model not using directly the delay labels, but using different statistics and then inferring the path delays with these simple statistics. So if we check in the port statistics, we can see that we have also uh, estimates of the uh, key utilization on each uh, port. And we can see that it ranges uh, from zero to one. This is, it's bounded on this range. And also a good insight is that we can observe that this distribution is maintained both in the training and the test data set. So we think that a good approach to face this challenge would be to directly predict the Q utilizations with uh, our network digital twin and then apply a simple post-processing to, to infer the path delays. So as an example, you can see a figure at the, at the bottom of the slide where we have a path that uh, traverses uh, one node in the middle. So if we are able to estimate the utilization of queues, we can just infer the the delay on each link by considering the, the utilization, the size of the queue, and the capacity of the, of the link. And then we can consider that the path delay is just the summation of the delays across the, the different links. 
So maybe this formula is uh, is difficult to to get in real time, but I am pretty sure that if you check it uh, more slowly, uh, then at home, if you are interested, uh, you will get it easily. Okay. So once I gave some some use, I I hope they are helpful. The, the, some helpful tips. I would like to to highlight the incentives for participating, particularly in this in, in this challenge. So for me, maybe the most important point is that uh, this is a good opportunity to be introduced in the application of uh, graph neural networks for networking. And as I motivated at the at the beginning of the presentation, this is nowadays a very hot topic, both in the machine learning field and also in the networking field. So this is the, the only competition that we have nowadays in the world on graph neural networks applied to, to data networks. Um, this is also a good opportunity to participate in a, in a popular event. So just as a reference in the previous edition of the ITU challenge, this problem had more than 120 participants from 24 different countries and we were very happy with the with the participation statistics and the results uh, because they were really impressive and going beyond the, the state of the art. And also uh, top three teams uh, after the celebration of the challenge will be publicly recognized in the website and will receive also certificates of uh, appreciation. And they will have also the possibility to publish the paper co-authored with the organizers, uh, with uh, <coughs> the people from our team, uh, if you are interested. Okay, and the most important part also here is that top three teams will have access to the global round of the ITU AI ML in 5G challenge. So they will be evaluated by the ITU judging committee across all the top solutions of the different problem statements. And finally, the top solutions will be awarded and also will have the opportunity to make a presentation at the, at the final conference that will be around December of 2021. And I think that this is a really interesting forum for, to, to present um, your own solutions. Okay, so just uh, to wrap up, I would like to, to give a quick summary. First of all, uh, I would like to, to give a special thanks to ITU for, for making all this possible. So especially to, to Thomas, Vishnu and Reinhardt that I think that they did a really good job uh, to, to push all this initiative. And I'm very happy to see that we have a new edition on this year of, of this challenge. So thank you very much, honestly. Okay, um, and then I would like to highlight that in, in this challenge, uh, there are two main profiles that can, that can participate. Of course, this is uh, open to the networking community as uh, the problem is uh, in the context of uh, data networks, but also I think that it is quite useful if you have a good uh, machine learning background or if you come from the machine learning community, as um, this the problem that we pose in this challenge is uh, a fundamental problem nowadays in the machine learning field. Um, particularly, we don't have uh, models, DNN models that can scale uh, well in in different scenarios. So I think it's quite an interesting topic uh, nowadays, both in the machine learning community and also in the networking community, given that uh, we need this kind of models to achieve uh, commercial solutions. So as main resources, we provide three main resources and uh, Brownnet, which is a main line. So we provide two open implementations, one in TensorFlow and the second one in Ignition. So you can uh, use whatever you want. The second one, we have an API that enables to easily read and process our data sets. And the third one is a mailing list that, where participants can ask uh, questions and engage. 
So if you are interested, I would highly recommend you to subscribe. So here you have a link to the, to the mailing list and you can find also it in the, in the challenge uh, website. I would like also to acknowledge all the people that uh, have participated in the organization. So particularly these are the members from the Barcelona Neural Networking Center that have uh, participated in this uh, initiative. So thank you to all of uh, them also. And finally, uh, I will give a, a brief uh, timeline. So the challenge uh, just started uh, yesterday on May 20th, and it will last uh, six months. And particularly it will finish on November 20th. So the registration is already open for participants. So I would like to encourage you to, to access the website and register for the challenge. Uh, also, we have a mailing list. So please, if you are interested, uh, subscribe to the mailing list. Here you have all the links. Um, well, the, the evaluation phase will be made on the last, uh, on the two, last two weeks, sorry, of September. And finally, the, the official announcement of uh, top solutions will be made at the end of uh, October. And finally, um, also, I would like to encourage you to, to uh, subscribe to the Slack channel of the ITU challenge. So I hope that uh, once this presentation finishes, these slides will be uh, publicly available. So you can check the link there and subscribe also to this Slack channel. Uh, for announcements on on the ITU challenge. Okay, so that's all. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Um, please, uh, if you have any questions or comments, uh, don't hesitate to, to make them. Thank you so much, Jose, for introducing the challenge. It's quite interesting that this year also we are having graphical networking challenge. And of course, I see questions uh, in the Q and A. So I would like to invite my colleague Vishnu. Uh, welcome, Vishnu. Good evening. Thanks, thanks, Thomas. And it is, of course, a pleasure to talk to my great uh, colleague and friend uh, Jose. Jose, it is very nice to see you again here. <laughs> so it, it was a it was a great challenge uh, last year. Uh, we, as you said, one of the most popular problem statements uh, from our side was yours. So it is, uh, it's, we are very happy that you are back here again. <laughs> so thank you so much. Uh, so now I would like to start with some very interesting questions which are here, uh, especially I would like to start with uh, the questions from Professor Jose, uh, UWS, our partner, UWS. Um, I would like to ask, uh, he's asking, are there uh, the, the training and testing data sets, you know? What is the similarity or difference between those? It's a very important question, I think, for the participants to understand what is the relationship between the training and testing data sets. Are they created using same Omnet that you explained? Or is there something different uh, between them? Of course, you mentioned the uh, size of the graph, but uh, could you please could you please explain uh, other similarities and differences, please? Okay, in the other, we have uh, quite, uh, uh, se we have several data sets already published. Uh, one of them were used uh, in our publications and also we have the one of the last edition, but uh, despite they are uh, all simulated with Omnet++, they are fundamentally different. So for example, in the last uh, edition, uh, probably they are referring to these uh, data sets, training and test. We wanted to check uh, if digital twins were able to, to generalize to different queues for scheduling policies. So in the training and validation data sets, we found networks that were um, that have had comparable sizes, but they had different uh, queue scheduling policies. And in this case, well, here in the slide you have the summary, but as uh, we focus on the, on the fundamental problem of uh, scalability, the idea is that we have small networks in the training data set and then large networks in the validation data sets. 
but the, the tool to simulate them is the, is the same. But yeah, the data is uh, fundamentally different. So the challenge is completely different. What about the nodes themselves, uh, the, the characteristics of the nodes themselves? Because he's asking queue size as well as the number of queues, etc. So could you comment on that, the, the properties of the nodes themselves? Well, we have uh, quite um, a lot uh, statistics, but uh, maybe the, the most important ones are the, um, the key utilization and the, the queue size. Probably, um, yes, I think that maybe they are the most important. Also at the flow level, we provide uh, characteristics of uh, delay, jitter, um, loss. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I wanted to ask you about uh, the application. So you already had some use cases. There were some questions on use cases. If you go back to slide eight, you had a very nice set of use cases. So there are some questions upon it. Um, one, I think you already answered, that is uh, what are the network domains where it is applied? I think this slide already answers that question. There is also another one, uh, Kim is asking whether uh, GNN applied to security domain, for example, DDoS, et cetera. Yeah, in, in, in ITU, we had some discussion around this, whether it applies and what are the, what are the use cases related to it. But I want to, I want to see your comments, Jose. Well, in the field of cybersecurity, I think that the application of GNN is, uh... There are very few works and very uh, preliminary uh, results. Uh, as to the best of my knowledge, I would say that there are few references on the field of uh, anomaly detection and profit classification as usually in, for example, in the field of um, of anomaly detection, uh, structuring the the data as graphs can be quite useful. Um, and in this case, GNN is, uh, fits completely this kind of data. Thank you. Uh, there is uh, another question from Pedro is asking, um, basically the question is, if we are evaluating hypothetical new router link, can we have Q? How can we have its Q occupancy that should be input to the twin? So, yeah, I think this goes back to the question that we were discussing, Jose, that what kind of uh, interfaces exist to the, to the digital twin? I think the question is uh, around that point that how can we configure the digital twin? For example, in the GNN case, how can we input uh, parameters like this? That's the question, I think. Okay, I think that the, 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 there can be different uh, interfaces based on the, on the specific use case. So particularly in this case, the, the main idea is to have, um, or let's say the generic use case of this box would be to have a, a description of the network state that can be generic and can be uh, dependent of, on the use case. And the output would be to generate uh, different performance metrics, but also it can be used for closed loop uh, architectures where, for example, you can connect it with an autonomous uh, controller and perform um, optimization on, on the network. I don't know if this uh, answers all, all the question or... Actually, let me, uh, uh, there is another related question. So let me ask that uh, uh, Xiang, Yun, Xiang Yun is asking, what kind of API is defined and uh, how to store data set? Uh, I guess, um, I guess the data sets you already provide, testing and training data sets you already provide. But I guess the question is uh, whether there should be enhancements to that. I remember we discussed a similar question last year as well. Um, whether we should enhance, enrich, augment the, the data sets that you give. Um, 
what is what is your opinion what kind of apis uh, i think you already meant ah there it is okay yeah. i will let you talk yeah please okay so for, first of all we provide a python api that is uh, quite easy to to use so indeed in if you use the baseline model uh, this model already uses this api so you can modify the the inputs and read the extract data very easily so we preload all the all the data from the data sets so this this should be almost transparent uh, for you um well the um, regarding the the possibility so with this uh, with this api you can uh, modify the model and use it uh, to to connect it with uh, your own model if you want to to generate your model from scratch okay okay and uh, you would provide uh, the api descriptions and other things as part of the uh, problem description right yeah, yeah we we will upload it in in some days yeah. okay okay uh, there is um, actually i want to ask you some question you you did mention about scalability right uh, so you did talk about some parts of it i mean why is it not scalable i mean you you did you did mention some uh, aspects of it in terms of the number of uh, nodes and uh, the traffic pattern I, I i noted these two things yes yes exactly so that that one so could you explain a little bit what is the fundamental problem why why is there a problem in scalability at all <laughs> so so this seems to be a fundamental problem and uh, you think it is important that is why you are you are in this problem statement today so i want to ask you what is the fundamental problem why is it not scalable well the idea is basically that uh, we have uh, a, a graph neural network model that is uh, for instance this uh, box so if we see during the training phase uh, some graphs that are limited in size then when when we see uh, different graphs that are much larger in size we are watching uh, a much higher number of uh, nodes and edges on graphs so basically this network in the end is a, a a graph representation so this model will not be able to in principle to model uh, these uh, connections as uh, it can uh, the new values can uh, explode for example if we got, if we have uh, higher values so we have a specific phase that is called the message passing phase and if we aggregate much uh, much more values than those that we saw during the training phase uh, it is difficult that it can generalize uh, well. So I think that uh, by <clears throat> making some changes in the structure, you can, for example, um, try to um, smooth this effect in the message passing architecture and make it, is, it more scalable. But nowadays, it's a, an unsolved problem. And also, sorry, coming back to, to the comment that you made um, earlier, about data augmentation so the, the idea is the, that for this challenge as uh, it is based on scalability uh, it is allowed to make uh, data augmentation techniques so the idea is that participants should be limited to use the data from our data sets so they can derive new samples from our data sets but it's not allowed to to generate new new samples for example with a with a network simulator. So the idea is that at the end, uh, the top solutions will be validated from our side. So we will check the solutions. Uh, we will train with our training data sets. Uh, they should document their solutions. So we can reproduce all the training uh, workflow and check that it is that we can get the results uh, reported. What about the traffic patterns? I mean, between the testing and training data sets, are they similar? Well, traffic patterns are quite similar. So the, the per path uh, traffic volumes follow similar distributions. 
but of course uh, the the aggregated traffic on links is uh, much larger in the in the large network so indeed one the second feature that i highlighted is that we have higher link capacities as uh, central links of the large networks need uh, to carry much more traffic mm -hmm. okay uh, there is a question on graph db i don't i mean i am no i am familiar with you know jose i've been using that uh, for a while but i don't know whether you are familiar with it uh, jose uh, it's basically a graph database. Uh, the question is that is it uh, related? Are you using graph database or not? Well, indeed, we don't we don't use uh, graph database. So we have our own uh, format for the data set that is a simple CSV. We I think that for us at least it's better to use a standard formats. So the idea is that uh, we have our own format and we use uh, our own API to, to easily process uh, the data. So to be honest, I, uh, I didn't know the graph DB, but in our case, probably is, I don't know if it makes a lot of sense. Also in, in Ignition, which is the, the framework that we are that uh, where we provide an open implementation, uh, we use uh, Network X, which is a well-known uh, graph library that enables to process also more efficiently and uh, more easily the the data. So they they have a very good toolkit on on processing graphs. You can visualize them, and yeah, I think that is it's a good high-level abstraction for for people that is not very familiar to to TensorFlow or PyTorch. No. Uh, okay, thank you so much. I want to ask you one very important question. You talked about incentive. You talked about incentive for participants. So from your last year's experience, I want to ask you on behalf of the participants, I think I asked you this last time also, <laughs> how do I win? So, so let's say I am a participant I'm trying to win this. Uh, you told all these incentives. So I want to win. Uh, I really like it now. How should I win? Could you tell some very secret tips just for me? <laughs> I'm joking. Everybody's listening. But what are the secret tips that you would say which makes a difference? So as a problem statement owner, when would you give a thumbs up to an entry? Okay, so just as a reference, the Roundnet has uh, an initial relative error, which is the evaluation score of 300 percent. Uh, 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 okay, so the the last objective is to minimize this uh, metric. So to make this uh, in the end. Mm, I think that is very important, particularly in this uh, in this uh, problem, to check very carefully all the different features, the distributions of the different features. Like for example, the the problem that I'm pointing out here, I think this is uh, quite fundamental. So maybe if we can make kind of a, a, a change in our design that prevents the model from facing this uh, distribution shifting, I think this is a, a good path uh, towards uh, be successful. <laughs> so here also we have uh, specific tips that uh, I'm aware that probably in real time it's difficult to, to get them, but um, just uh, by careful checking, carefully checking the data sets, maybe this would be a, a good approach you see in some port statistics in your model or something like that yeah. okay okay thank you so much for those tips uh, so you mentioned a paper right uh, which uh, i know i know uh, you would uh, want to and it is a great idea also to push these solutions to publications so uh, what are you looking for this year? So in, let's say, in an ideal case, it's a, it's a, let's say, a great idea in the form of a solution. This is what we are looking for, right? So in the form of a solution, we get a great idea. What is that great idea? What are you looking for in a publication at the end of the year, let's say? 
Well, um, I would say that uh, solutions that fundamentally solve the, the challenge. I think this is an open challenge, uh, both in the machine learning community and the networking community. It is very it is very relevant. And I would say that uh, if the solution, if we can consider that the solution solves the problem uh, by showing good scalability properties, I think this is a, a great success. And this can be a, a very good uh, publication. So indeed, in the last edition, we post uh, another fundamental challenge to achieve uh, production-ready GNN solutions. Um, we got really impressive uh, results uh, beyond the state of the art. So we submitted a paper with top solutions, and we were really very happy with the, with the results. So I, I would expect that this uh, edition will also produce uh, solutions at, the, at this level, beyond the state of the art. Thank you, thank you. Um, we we are really cutting it close, but I want to ask you one more question about the role of standards. Um, you know, we are interested in standardization. So we, we always look at uh, technical specifications which uh, can solve interoperability problems or recommendations which can solve um, interoperability and standardization issues. Where does standards come into picture here? According to your understanding, where is standardization problem here? For example, could you tell one or two um, reference points where you think there are multiple uh, vendors or multiple solutions possible and interoperability is a challenge for digital twins or GNN, whatever, whatever is the problem here? Okay, so here you have just uh, some examples of use cases. I think that it can, it, they can be a good starting point to consider standardization activities. So the main idea is to, to find how can the digital twin interface with the, with the network. Uh, we can consider, um, for instance, two different kind of uh, operations, which are offline operation, for example, if we have uh, an autonomous network controller and we want to, uh, or a product in general, and we want to test it in the in a secure environment before it is deployed in the in the real world network, this kind of solutions is uh, can be fundamental, can be very interesting to to validate uh, these products, and also for for online operation tasks, I think that uh, we need uh, to. To, to define the interface with the network and with the uh, optimization or uh, the optimization controller or uh, whatever acts over the network and needs uh, an accurate network model, particularly in, in the context of uh, scenarios that are aware of quality of service, I would say. Otherwise, we can use uh, simpler models. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there is a question which is asking, uh, is it uh, similar to a regression task on edge features? I think uh, this means the graph edge and uh, um, maybe, maybe it is related to your uh, description of, um, of uh, combination of machine learning and uh, GNNs, I, I'm not understanding the question, but the question is whether it is a regression task, similar to a regression task on edge features. What is your comment? Okay, uh, well, it depends on how, how you define the, the graph neural network. So for example, if you take a round net as an input, a graph basically has uh, nodes and edges. Well, what we uh, do in RoundNet is that we consider a new graph representation where uh, links of the real network or the reference uh, network scenario is a node and paths are another kind of nodes. And in this graph representation, edges are just relationships between paths and links, which is uh, indeed the routing configuration. So in this case, if we want to predict uh, properties at the level of links uh, or at the level of paths, it is indeed a regression task in on nodes of, of the graph, not on edges. But uh, yes, it is it is a regression task uh, 
in the sense that we need to produce uh, a real value. No, it's not the case of a classification where we just need to point uh, to one specific uh, node or or class. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you so much. Um, uh, the another question is, uh, is there any difference in view of processing data between GNN and graph database? I don't know whether that is uh, a good question, but I want to ask your comments. Okay, let me check. Mm, well, um, I'm not sure about the question. I would say that a uh, graph neural network has a standard uh, message passing process, or let's say a, a generic message passes process, and we can um, customize it to uh, specifically to our problem. And this is basically a, a machine learning model. So the idea is that we can use it uh, for, in this case, for supervised learning. We can uh, adapt it to reinforcement learning. So I understand that graph databases uh, are just uh, can be just used to efficiently store the data and structure it. So maybe it is a, a different problem or a different solution that uh, what. They are they have different uh, purposes, I would say. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, I agree. Yeah, yeah. From my reading of uh, graph database, I agree with you that uh, it is basically a good solution for capturing relationship between data and uh, querying in uh, based on the relationship. That's that's all that I I see. Uh, with that, we come to the close of uh, questions, and uh, it is a very interesting problem statement as uh, last time. I would encourage all participants to uh, to really really take advantage of the fact that uh, Jose has spent so much time and uh, come back with the problem statement. Uh, and I can tell you from last year's experience that we had excellent mentorship uh, from uh, Jose and colleagues in uh, Barcelona. So thank you so much, Jose, for staying back. Uh, we are over the hour, but you are here staying back and answering the questions patiently. So thank you so much. Over to you, Thomas. Okay, so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vishnu. And thanks so much, uh, Jose, for the time and answering the questions. Please make sure to join next week's webinar and also webinars that have been scheduled to take place in the near future. Thank you so much and have a good day.